Okay, gang, let's take a look at a few multiple choice questions together. So here's example 11. It says, rejecting a true alternate hypothesis. All right, so we're gonna reject a true alternate. It says, is a type one error, has the probability of one minus beta of occurring, is a type two error, is a correct decision. So first of all, we would never actually say we're gonna reject a true alternate. I get that that's how this question is set up, but we always say we're gonna reject H naught or fail to reject H naught. So you would never actually hear a statistician say, I'm gonna reject a true alternate, but okay, that's the setup of this question. Well, if you're rejecting something that's true, I wanna say for sure it is not a correct decision. So there's no way D is going to be our answer. But let's think about what we've got here. We've got H naught and we've got HA. So I just, I touched on that, you know, we would say reject H naught or fail to reject H naught, but it, let's pretend we're not statisticians for just a moment and then we'll go back to being statisticians. One of these two sentences is true. Like either the null is true or the alternate's true. And we're trying to figure out which one is true, given again that we're always just assuming the null is true. Okay, well with that, if the alternate is really the true sentence, if this is the true sentence, and I mistakenly rejected it, meaning I actually failed to reject H naught. All right, so I thought the first equation was true. We are making an error of some, set, some sort. And when the second and I put equation, because the alternate isn't technically an equation, it's an inequality, um, whether it's less than, greater than, or not equals to, but if the alternate is true and you mistakenly keep the null, that's gonna be a type two error because it's the second equation. And again, whatever number is here, that refers to the true sentence. So the answer here is C. Or if you wanna go back to how we originally defined errors, right? When you reject H naught, you might make a type one error. And when you fail to reject H naught, you might've made the type two error. And here, we failed to reject H naught, or another way of saying that um, is saying we, we kept H naught. So I potentially made a type two error here. So that's the answer to this question. All right, in example 12, we say in hypothesis testing, the less the likelihood of a type one error, the less the likelihood of a type two error, okay? Now when it says less the likelihood, right, this is probability. So we're talking about the probability of a type one error and we're comparing that to the probability of a type two error. I'll use the number here since I used a number on this one. Okay, so keep in mind, this always gets the symbol alpha, this always gets the symbol beta. And we talked way back in example six about the relationship between the two of these um, probabilities, right? So back in example six, or right before example six, we talked about using a smaller alpha increases beta or vice versa. So if you have a larger alpha, you're gonna have a smaller beta. And if you have a smaller alpha, you're gonna have a larger beta. And, and we talked about that when we, if you remember when we were talking about whether or not we wanted to shut down a part of the Oregon coast for fishing. And that was dependent on whether or not we had um, fish that had too high of a mercury concentration. And in that example, we had decided that the type two consequence, right, um, leaving open an unsafe fishing area, that was worse than closing down a safe fishing area. So we wanted a smaller beta here, and that consequentially meant our alpha would have been larger. So it comes down to when you're deciding between what do you want, larger alpha, larger beta, you, you should look at which error or which consequence from those errors is worse. All right, but we wanted to remember that yin-yang relationship. And when I mention yin-yang, I mean as one goes up, the other goes down, right? As one goes up, the other goes down. All right, so let's see if we can piece together the answer to this one. All right, so the less the likelihood of type one, so as alpha goes down, is it true that beta goes down? And that's not true, that is not the relationship. All right, the relationship is as one goes down, the other goes up. All right, the less the likelihood of a type one error, the more the likelihood of a type two error. And there's the yin yang, right? So this is my true sentence, all right? The likelihood of type two errors will not be affected by the likelihood of type one errors. That's not true. Again, we've talked about that yin-yang relationship. And the sum of the probabilities of a type one and type two errors must equal one. 
You sure hope not, because that would mean no matter what, you were gonna make an error. Whenever probabilities are one, that means it happens every single time. You don't want to make an error every single time. Ideally, you want those probabilities to add up to zero, meaning you never want to make an error. It's just the only way to do that is to run the census. All right, so the only true sentence in here is, is answer B, is option B. Okay, so with that, let's, let's try example 13. Okay, so let me move that up, it's looking good. All right, so this is a random sample of 100 voters in a community produced 59 voters in favor of candidate A. The observed value of the test statistic for testing the null hypothesis H not P equals 50% versus the alternate H A P equal, excuse me, does not equal 50% is this. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of information, but where I always think we should start the, these questions is which land am I in? And based on the writing of the null, you can see that I'm in prop land, which means I'm going to use a Z test statistic. All right. And I have one sample, all right? I, I, they only ran this once. It didn't say I, I took a random sample of 100 voters on one day, and then uh, on another day I took a different random sample. This is just one sample. And everything in chapters eight and nine is one sample. In chapter 10, we'll bump up to two. And then in chapters 11 and 13, we're gonna bump up to three or more. All right, but ultimately this says, what's the value of the test statistic? Well, if we're talking about a test statistic, we're talking about that number that pops up in part nine of your write-up. And here's our formula for the test statistic, right? Our z-score is always p prime minus the null proportion in relation to the standard error, right? Value minus mean over standard deviation. So I'm gonna write this down, all right? Keeping in mind that p sub zero is our null proportion. And then let, let's calculate that number, okay? So here we go. I know for this problem, since they're asking me for the test statistic, z is gonna equal p minus p prime. Oops, I wrote that backwards. Give me a moment to find my, my eraser. There we go. It's actually p prime minus p. So I got p prime minus p over a standard error. So we got p one minus p over n. Okay. So let's see if we can figure out what numbers I'm going to plug in here. So P prime is always your statistic, meaning it comes from sample data. So if we look here, we did have two proportions. You can see 50% here is the null proportion. But then there's our sample proportion of 59 out of 100. So let me just write that here. I know P prime is 59 out of 100. And you could use your calculators to get this number, but I think we'll agree for the most part it's 0.59. Okay, so this is gonna be 0.59 minus my null proportion, which is 50%. And I'm gonna put that in ratio to the standard error that I would have gotten from the sampling distribution for the sample proportion. So we got 50%, one minus 50%, and what was our sample size N was 100. So if I can crunch this number on my calculator, that's gonna be my answer. So I'm gonna do this the long way. I'm actually gonna crunch it on my calculator. And then I wanna show you how I could use the one prop Z test to get the answer that much quicker. Okay, so if I'm gonna do this, let me turn my calculator on. Looks like I had a bell curve in there. Let me go back, clear this out. All right, here we go. So my numerator, actually I'm gonna do my denominator first. So inside that radical, we had 0.5 times one minus 0.5 and I needed to divide that by 100. I wanna take the square root of that number, and keep in mind that would be my denominator. So this 0.05 is this number down here. So on my numerator, and I'm gonna protect it with parentheses, I'm gonna do 0.9, excuse me, 0.59 minus 0.5. I'm gonna divide it by my denominator, and it looks like my test statistic is the number 1.8. Okay. So look at that, there's 1.8, my answer would be A. Now I would, I would say that this, putting this in on your calculator, it's a, it's a bit much, right? There's a lot of room for error in terms of misplaced parentheses and things like that. So what I would recommend is instead of crunching this here, use your one proportion Z test. So let's go over to stat, we'll go over to tests. Now keep in mind, we're in proportion land, 
right? So I know I'm either gonna use options five or six because it has the word prop by it. I'm gonna use five because I only had one sample, okay? My null proportion was 0.5. These next two numbers have to be whole numbers, right? It's number successes and then my sample size. So we'll go 59 out of 100. Um, what was our alternate? We had, if I look at it, it looks like we had a not equals to for our alternate. So let me go make that live. And then I'm just gonna hit calculate. And there's my 1.8, right? And I, I would just say that, that to me that's a lot faster. I'm not getting too confused on where parentheses go and when I have numerators and denominators to match out or manage out. So there it is, 1.8. So you could get it the, the longer way, which is totally legit, or I would just recommend using technology, right? We have technology now, so it's a great idea to use it, okay? All right, so again, statistic, right? Sample proportion, parameter, null proportion, okay? They both get used in your test statistic, but the null proportion gets put in for this P here because it's the proportion that we're assuming is true, right? Unless we have enough evidence from our sample data to counterbalance that. All right, so let's move on to 14. I'm gonna move this up. All right, so there we go. So taking a look at this one, this says use the given information to find the p-value. Okay, so I ultimately want a p-value. I want a number between zero and one. Use a 5% level of significance and state the conclusion. All right, I'm either gonna reject or fail to reject. Okay, so I've gotta get a p-value, that's the first part. And it looks like I'm basically battling between two numbers, either, either a 20% p-value or a 41% p-value. And just looking at those, before I even get going on deciding which, which of these is the correct number, you can imagine that either way, if your p-value is 20% or if it's 41%, both of those numbers are greater than 5%, right? This p-value is greater than 5% and this p-value is greater than 5%. So either way, I know I'm gonna fail to reject the null. So I know A cannot be my answer and D cannot be my answer. All right, so I'm gonna say it again. No matter which of these two numbers are true, I know my p-value will ultimately be greater than alpha. And whenever it's greater than alpha, I know I'm going to fail to reject H0. Right? There is no question about it. That is the decision we make. So either way, whether the p-value is 20% or whether the p-value is 41%, I'm gonna be failing to reject that null. Now, it doesn't state here that I'm in proportion land, but I'm gonna assume I'm in proportion land just because um, I've got a z-score here. Theoretically, I could be in proportion land or mean land, but I said for this class, anytime we see a z's, we're gonna be in proportion land. All right, so as I'm moving through this, I'm gonna make the assumption that I'm in prop land, okay? I'm gonna say I got one sample, uh, I, I know I'm gonna be using a z-score because it gave it to me, but now I gotta find this p-value. All right, well, I didn't give you any raw data, so you actually can't use your one prop z-test. We're gonna do this the old school way. And here's the old school way, right? You have to decide whether or not you had a greater than, less than, or not equals to alternate. And based on that, we're either gonna find the area to the right of the z-score, to the left of the z-score, or we're gonna to have to double some stuff for symmetry. So let's see what option we're in right now. This says I have a right-tailed test. Okay, if I have a right-tailed test to find my p-value, I need the area under the z-curve, so that area under the standard normal curve to the right of the calculated z-score. So we're gonna be going to the right of a calculated z-score which is all fine and good, but let's get some, some feelings for what on earth I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna draw a picture here, okay. All right, here would be my bell curve, something like this, okay. This would be my Z curve. I know zero is under the peak, and we spent a good chunk of time drawing out standard deviations in chapter six, right? One, two, three, and then negative one, negative two, negative three. So imagine your z-score is somewhere around here, right, around 0.83, so pretty close to one. And I have a right-tailed test, so I'm gonna shade the area to the right of this z-score. Yeah. 
All right, so with that, if I wanna find my p-value, right? Your p-value is the area under the curve to the right of the calculated z, and I just graphed that. And looking at my graph, I feel like this number is gonna be closer to 20% rather than 40%. 40% I'd need to go closer to zero, because zero is the 50th percentile. So I have a feeling my answer is gonna be C when I get done, but, but I'm still gonna check it. I don't wanna say I know for sure. Anytime we want a probability, that's area under a curve. So I want the probability that Z is greater than 0.83. All right, we know we can use normal CDF to get that area under the curve. So we'll go normal CDF. I'm gonna go low. Oops, that was not the best looking zero, but low, high, mean, standard deviation. My low here is 0.83, right? My high on the z-axis is infinity, which we're gonna write in as 1E99. My mean is zero, and my standard deviation is one because we are on the standard normal curve. So let's see what we got here. We're gonna go normal CDF, 0.83 to infinity, zero, one. And which number are we coming out with? So it looks like it's 0.0233, okay? So my p-value is 0 0.2033, which matches exactly with answer C, right? Because again, my p-value would be greater than alpha, and I would fail to reject the null. So after we found our p-value, right, the area to the right of the calculated z-score, I made my decision, my p-value is greater than alpha, failed to reject h naught, And that lines up with answer C. All right, so moving right along, let's get to 15 here. Okay, so we got, oops, let me get that a little bit more straightened out, like so. Okay, so in an effort to curb certain diseases, especially acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, San Francisco has a program whereby drug users can exchange needles for fresh ones. As reported, 35% of 5,644 IV drug users in San Francisco admitted to sharing needles. Is this sufficient evidence to say that the rate of sharing needles has dropped from the pre-needle exchange rate of 66%? Okay, so let's take a look. First of all, what land am I in? I'm in proportion land. All right, I know I'm gonna be running a z-test and I only have the one sample. All right, my categorical variable here, what am I asking all of these 5,644 IV drug users? I'm saying, hey, do you exchange needles or not? And their answer is gonna be yes or no, right? So that's a categorical variable that I'm converting into a relative frequency or proportion. And I can see two proportions are here. Right? I have to decide which one is the statistic and which one is the parameter. And I always think the easier one to spot is the statistic. It says it right here. This 35% comes from our sample. So here I have my statistic. And here I have my parameter, right? The status quo. What's always been the rule as, as we're going through this problem. So my null is going to be P equals 66%. And for the alternate, you can see from this phrasing here, they're asking, hey, has it dropped, right? So has P become less than 66%? And just looking at the statistic, it sure looks like it's become less than 66%, right? To go from 66 down to 35, that's quite a significant drop. I'm gonna figure out how much of a drop that is, what's the z-score in just a moment, but that's, that's a pretty significant drop. Okay, so it looks like I need to find my p-value, right? Because in all of these options, they're talking about the p-value. Here is it less than 0 0.0001. Is it between 1% and 5%? Is it between 5% and 10%? Is it greater than 10%? So I've got to find the p-value. So I'm going to do this the long way, and then I'm going to go ahead and show you how I would use my calculator to help me work around the long way. So the long way is always getting that test statistic, just like we did in example 13. So we'll go P prime minus P in ratio to a standard error. I'm gonna plug my numbers in for this problem. So it looked like the sample proportion was 35%, the null proportion was 66%, and I'm gonna use that null proportion to build my standard error. And this is 
where, like I said, the cumbersome part comes in in crunching this number on your calculator. So I'm gonna try and crunch this over here just so you can see mostly what I'm doing. So let me clear all this out. I'm gonna do my denominator first. I've gotta do 1.66 times its complement divided by 5644. I've gotta take the square root of that number. All right, and then in the numerator, I have 0.35 minus 0.66 divided by that answer. Whoo, look at that. A z-score of negative 49.16. So I want you to just think about this for a moment. What this is trying to tell us is this test statistic, this z-score, is 49 standard deviations below the mean. That if the null is true, our test statistic, we are 49 deviations below average. Right? This is impossible. Nobody's ever 49 deviations below average. I can already tell I'm going to reject the null, and I'm going to super reject the null. I mean, imagine if I tried to graph this, right? If I was to go back here just to scooch up a little bit and try and find a z-score of negative 49, it's like way over here. There's no way that I'm gonna fail to reject the null here. I'm, I'm gonna super reject it. But let's go figure out what that p-value is because I need to decide which of these intervals it falls in. Okay, so for this p-value, it looks like I have a less than alternate. So I'm gonna find the p-value here by saying what's the probability that z is less than negative 49.16. So to do that, I'm gonna go normal CDF, right? We're gonna go low, which is negative infinity, high, mean, standard deviation. So let's see what number we're coming up with here. So normal CDF, low, high, oops, I think I forgot a decimal point mean and standard deviation. Um, yeah, I'm looking at zero, right? But there is no way that if the null was true, we would get sample data like this just by chance. So when I go to answer this question, my p-value, where is it? Is it below 0 0.001? Is it between 1% and 5%? 5% and 10%? Is it larger than 10%? This thing is zero. We're definitely below 0.001. I, there is no evidence, or there's, I should say, there's strong evidence, I'm going to phrase it the other way, strong evidence that the, the needle sharing rate has dropped from the pre-needle exchange rate. Now, this is all fine and good, right? It takes me a little while to do it, but I can do it. I would say it might be a little bit faster to use your calculator, but I want to talk about common errors I see in this type of problem when students try to use their calculators. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. If we hit stat, go over to test, and hit option five, I get this all the time. Okay, so students will say, all right, Miss A, null proportion 66%. My sample proportion was 35%. I talked to 59, 5,944 users, in, or IB drug users, and I have a less than alternate. Okay, so I've mentioned this a couple times. I've said previously that these two numbers have to be whole numbers, and I want you to just take note, I did not put a frequency count here, I put a relative frequency count. You put the statistic, or I should say, well it is a statistic, but you put the sample proportion. Watch what happens, right? Your calculator freaks out. It says, hey, you have a domain error, okay? So let's go back and figure out what we needed to do. I don't want 35% here. I want to know out of those 5,900, oh, excuse me, oh, I wrote 5944. This should have been 5644, excuse me. But either way, let me, let me run it again. You, you still would have gotten an error, okay? So what I need to do here is out of those 5,644 IV drug users, how many were successes? And again, here a success means that you're sharing a drug needle. Well, I know that the sample proportion is 35%. And if you remember all the way back from chapter one, if we wanted to get to relative frequency, right, this was equal to your frequency count divided by your sample size, right? That's how we, we always went from frequency to relative frequency. We took our frequency count divided by sample size and got a proportion. So if you go from frequency to relative frequency by dividing by sample size, you can go backwards from relative frequency to frequency if you multiply by sample size. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say, hey, I would like 
on my 5,644 IV drug users? How many, again, successes did I have in my sample? And your calculator will say, hey, you had 1,975.4 folks exchanging needles out of your sample of 5,644. So let me just rate this here that if I wanted to get the actual frequency count, I would do 5,644 times 35% and I would get 1975.4. And again, some students will be like, all right, I'm there. And you hit calculate and you get another domain error. And you're like, what, what's going on? What goes back to what I originally said? These two numbers have to be whole numbers. So when they gave you this statistic of 35%, it was some kind of rounded number. So if I take a look at the closest whole number to 1975.4, that would be 1975. If I divided that by 5,644, you can see why they're reporting 35%, right? You would have rounded that decimal to 35%. So we're gonna ignore, we're gonna truncate the 0.4 here. All right, oops, wrong. Let me go down to a prop test. So let me just take this to 1975. And now I'm not gonna have a domain error. And there it is, there's my test statistic, right? Step 10, here's step 11, I see my p-value. So I could have gotten to answer A without doing any of this stuff, but you do wanna be careful that you take this to a whole number, all right? So frequency counts to what we actually observe, and it needs to be a whole number, okay? All right, so let's try a few more multiple choice questions and then we'll almost be done with this chapter, bye.